ever tried to deal with anger? I mean, like, sort of a, as an issue? Um, you stop and look at yourself and your life and you say, hmm, a little bit too much anger in my mind here. Uh, it's gotten a hold of me and it's taking me places that I don't want to go. And the feeling itself, I'm kind of getting heartily sick of. Just the feeling in and of itself. Anger is just too much. Um... A lot of people, I guess, who are consumed by anger don't even get to that point because they subscribe to the view of anger as propounded by, I guess, um, Homer, that um, anger is, what does he call it, sweeter than honey. Um, the person who has that kind of anger doesn't even see their anger as a problem. Um, they see their anger as a perfectly reasonable uh, reaction to that which is befalling either themselves or others. Um, <clears throat> so we have two sort of people that are fundamentally angry here. One sees it as a virtue almost, or at least something benign, I guess, or n value neutral, and another person sees it as a vice. Um, pretty fundamental questions. What is anger? Is anger a good or a bad thing, or does it have does it have neutral value? Anger, in and of itself, it depends on the circumstance. Some people would say, and you know, um, <clears throat> uh, Seneca says that it's just thoroughly bad. Um, other people would say, no, no. Sometimes anger is perfectly justified, um, and some people would say anger is almost always perfectly justified. So. What is anger's fundamental nature, and what value should we place on it? Well, that's one huge question. Uh, before you can even start to deal with that anger issue that you've identified in yourself, um, you, you, you don't even know really what value anger has yet uh, at this point. Um, a lot of people who have an anger problem just don't see it as a problem. <clears throat> a lot of people who have an anger problem see it as a problem, but feel powerless to do anything about it, because it's so seductive. <laughs> um, going back to my view of time or reality, or I guess we'd call it the stream of becoming, um, Pyro is big on this, the information screen, uh, stream. Uh, recap, the normal view of time is... Um, People are in a moving car, but they're looking at the back window and watching the world go by this way. Um, a more accurate view of time, or I guess a more proactive view of time, is to, or of the information stream, is to turn around and look over the driver's shoulder through the windshield into the face of the information uh, stream, the inform the in into the face of becoming. Again, that's often... Um, often portrayed as a monster because it can be terrifying. It can blow your mind. Um, Zoppe says that it can. Um, Nietzsche said, uh, or Zoppe said that it will destroy you if you look into the the uh, stream of becoming. Um, uh, Nietzsche seems to imply that it can drive you insane, but I guess the Ubermensch is quite capable of staring it in the face. Um, other w others would say that it's, I guess, liberation itself. You're actually looking into the face of reality, the constant flux of everything. And in Amor Fati, that monster that you stared in the face, that <laughs> um, is no longer a monster. <laughs> it's something beautiful. So here's the situation that we're in. We're in the information stream. We are in the stream of becoming. Things are coming at us. Because uh, we've decided, for whatever reason, <laughs> to uh, look that monster in the face. To face becoming head-on. <laughs> uh, a dangerous thing, I, I suppose. Um, I meditate, and that's one of the major things that one of the main things that you approach with extreme caution when you're dealing with these things inside your own mind, when you're sort of thinking, okay, just imagine what the information stream is. Uh, imagine what um, 
all the what reality looks like when all the biases are taken away from it, and it can be pretty disorienting to say the least because we place bias on absolutely everything. So, um, this is, in my view, or to the best of my knowledge, what we are, what reality is, is endless becoming, panta hrai. <laughs> um, <clears throat> now, so here we are in the information stream. Here we are, um, that guy sitting in his couch with the TV screen right in front of him, and it's blasting him in the face. And like him, we're holding our own. Like him, we've got a handle on things. Um, maybe we're not at the stage of amor fati yet, but we haven't been destroyed by the by it. Um, or even, I suppose, we could be looking through the rear window of the car and watch watching things go by instead of actually watching them appear and come at us. We're just watching them as they recede apparently the way most people see reality. Most people see time. Well, things come at you, or things appear and stay there. They recede into the distance, but they stay there for a while. That's the stream of becoming. Um, I mentioned that uh, in many cases, it's the, the looking through the windshield is looking into the open maw of a monster with horrible things coming out of it. Well, <clears throat> how does that relate to anger? Well, first of all, in Amor Fati, you must love all of it. You must love everything that comes out of that monster's mouth. <laughs> uh, tall order, isn't it? But hey, Nietzsche wasn't preaching to the herd. He was preaching to the few people that had courage in his view, or greatness, or potential greatness. Um, he wasn't preaching to Zapfi's cavemen, who simply couldn't handle reality. Um, so it's it's a tall order to love that which comes out of the monster's mouth. It's a very tall order to love the stream of becoming, which is normally portrayed as a horrible thing. Or at least a horrifying thing. Not a horrible thing, but a horrifying thing, because we're so addicted to black, white, good, evil value judgments on everything. Um, now, anger in that situation, I would assume, or I would illustrate as, something has come into the information stream that, for whatever reason, shouldn't be there. <laughs> Um, something is happening in one's life that one believes should not be happening. <laughs> something has befallen you that you think should not be there. <laughs> and that makes you angry because that's an injustice, right? It. Wait a minute. The information stream, the, the, the stream of becoming, Pantaraya now has stuff in it that's not supposed to be there. <laughs> um, I always go back to that interesting juxtaposition between um, the pagan gods of antiquity and Christianity. Uh, a pagan objection to the Christian god would be, you portray God the way you want God to be, and we portray the gods the way they really are. <laughs> um, because we know that all kinds of stuff comes in that we don't necessarily want to be there in our lives, in our information stream, in the stream of becoming. Flies in the ointment. Things happen that you have, for whatever reason, decided don't belong in your information stream. Um, just in the very fundamental nature of reality. It shouldn't be there. Um, it's not fair. Your rights are being violated. You have a right to a clear pantarai. <laughs> you, you know, it, 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 that's the only way I can express this. It's like, um, instead of reality being what it is, you've decided reality ought to be something. <laughs> um, 
and reality is what it is. There's no ought for reality <laughs> itself. But to the mind that seeks to categorize everything efficiently and accurately and keep its bearings at all times and understand everything as it comes at us and place value on everything, every last image that comes out of the monster's mouth, every last form that comes out of the monster's mouth, we go good, bad, good, bad, good, bad, good, bad, good, bad, good, bad. Well, the stuff that's bad um, is not always uh, stuff that makes us angry. We've come to accept a lot of things in life. Uh, the biggest one, I guess, is mortality, although I suppose there are people out there who are pretty steamed about the fact that they have to die eventually. Um, but, you know, we generally speaking, uh, there are a lot of bad things in life that we accept. We just take it for granted. I hate the fact that I'm constantly interrupted throughout my day by calls of nature. I have to go to urinate or whatever, and it bugs me that, you know, if, if I'm, you know, talking in front of a large group of people and suddenly I <laughs> nature calls, I, ah, you know, um, but I accept that as a function of my biology. But there are other things that um, we won't accept or can't accept or believe we it would be an injustice to accept. Um, I don't know, just injustice in general. You know, if you're not part of the solution, you're part of the problem, yada, yada, yada. If you accept bad things, then you're complicit. Um, all that uh, is required for evil to triumph is for good men to do nothing, yada, yada. Um, guilt. <clears throat> guilt is v uh, very wrapped up in, I believe, the, um, the notion that something is in the stream of becoming that shouldn't be there. There's some sort of injustice that is happening. Some sort of profoundly wrong thing that is taking place. Where did that thing's wrongness come from? Um, where is the that shouldn't be there idea coming from? Is it inherent in the universe? Are there things in the universe that shouldn't be there? Or even in the information stream, in the stream of becoming, is there are there things in that that shouldn't be there? Um, no. Well, I suppose we could argue that. Um, but, again, you look at the universe or the information stream or Panta uh you have two choices. You look at it and you see what it should be, or you look at it and you see what it is. <laughs> um, if you decide that it should be something, and that should is repeatedly violated, there's a good chance that some kind of anger will arise. Um, because if you believe that something shouldn't be in your stream of becoming, you also probably believe that that is a reasonable expectation. You probably believe that it's reasonable for me to expect the information stream or the stream of becoming or reality or the universe or whatever term you want to use, the cosmos, you think that that's a reasonable expectation. And if your reasonable expectations are violated or violated enough, you're going to get mad. <laughs> um, but it goes back to that question. Was that a reasonable expectation? Is any expectation reasonable? <laughs> that makes you think, eh? Is, is it is it reasonable for me to expect a universe without Auschwitzes? Is it reasonable for me to expect to um, go into a movie theater and not get interrupted by the need to urinate? <laughs> Is it um, reasonable for me to expect to walk down the street and not get bumped into by people? Um, Is it reasonable uh, for me to click on the news and 
Nazi bad stuff. <laughs> um, I would say it's not necessarily reasonable. And out of this, I guess, out of this belief in violated should, a should that is in your information stream is sort of part of the picture, has been violated. This should. <laughs> there shouldn't be horrible things coming out of the monster's mouth. Um, you get angry. Now, um, that's, I think, a good view, in my opinion. <laughs> it's not my actual idea here. I've just sort of explained it in my own terms. It took me a very long time to formulate this idea, but it's all a pastiche of pieces that I've gotten from other people or other writings or thought about other things. Um, so I don't have any claim to um, newness here. So things are coming at us through the information stream, and there are things that shouldn't be in there. First of all, where does that should come from? Is odd gap, right? Um, um, is ought well ought is a is an interesting thing again what does should mean well and where where does where, what's the or, or origin of should it's the idea of justice i suppose the universe should be just in a utilitarian universe or an idea when we have ideals like utilitarianism there is an expectation that you know <laughs> bad things shouldn't befall people is that a reasonable expectation do you expect reality to be what it is or do you expect reality to be what it ought to be um, this is a response to Luke Taylor God Shiva and I guess it's gone on longer than I thought it would it's probably gonna have to be a several part or one or two parts of this video but um, it's interesting that I just been reading up on the ancient Vedic Hindu God Rudra Rudra um, the Hindu, the ancient Hindu god of rage. <laughs> um, and it's fascinating how the way he's approached by um, the more cerebral, uh, more brainiac kind of Hindu philosopher in terms of understanding and dealing with anger. Uh, I've got an image below of Rudra, uh, modern, and it's a stock photo, so it's got that little watermark on it, but whatever, it's it's interesting. Um, shows you what uh, Rudra is. He's just the god of ferocious rage. Um, the Howler, I guess, is the way his name is translated from ancient Sanskrit. <clears throat> um, an anthropomorphization of rage itself extreme aversion not horror rage sort of an offensive kind of horror a horror that has gone on the attack um, in the fight or flight it's decided to fight <laughs> um, and rage in the context of the stream of becoming the chaos of becoming is a fascinating and I think toxic combination um, rage feeds off itself the more rage you put in the more the uh, your information stream seems to require uh, it's a function I think of our ideas are we live in an extremely idealistic age and there's so much stuff that goes on in the world that we believe should not be there <laughs> and it makes us angry so, in order to deal with this gigantic concept, this massive fly in the ointment, this massive um, apple in the Garden of Eden, in the this massive blip in the information stream, the Hindus have anthropomorphized it and and just said Rudra. Now. Um, that's just, you know, again, just for the sake of argument, you have to put a face on certain things uh, to discuss them. And Rudra's natures, he has many, are a fascinating thing. Uh, and you could say this about just about any 
uh, god of rage. Um, there are many different gods of anger in, in many different mythoses. Mythi? I don't know. Um, and they all seem to share certain things in common. They all uphold justice. They all um, seem to be the one to destroy um, the evil. Uh, they're also horrible if you get on their bad side. <laughs> um, it's like, you know, your stereotypical hillbilly who will give you the shirt off his back if he likes you. If you somehow make him angry, you'd better get out of his way. He's going to kill you. <laughs> uh, just no moderation in his thinking. So there's the anger itself and that part of you which is angry. Um, in Amor Fati, you can seek to placate that part of yourself which is angry, um, which I guess has come down to us with things like people worshipping or placating gods of anger. They're really just trying to placate their own anger. Rudra has come into me. I'm in a rage. Um, you know, it's just ancient anger management. Instead of just seeing anger and saying, I'm going to go to a therapist and talk about it and try and work it out in my own head, I'm just doing it metaphorically and symbolically, um, using a mythology, uh, anthropomorphizing it. I, if you ask me, it's six of one, half a dozen of the other. Um, I don't have, as I say, this aversion that most people, most unbelievers have to using images like this. Um, doesn't bother me in the least. I don't feel a, that I'm going to be infected by <laughs> religion or whatever. <clears throat> so, something has come into your information stream, some huge blip that you, that you believe should not be there. So first of all, you have to examine that should. Is that a reasonable should? You believe that it's reasonable. Is it? Is, the, is, a, a, is, a, is there a true universe out there that is devoid of these things, in other words? Devoid of blips. Secondly, is there guilt in the information stream? If I practice Amor Fati, and Hitler comes along and says, I'm going to create another Auschwitz, or, you know, it's 1935 or whatever, and he decides he's going to create one. And I decide I'm going to love my fate, and my fate is I lived through that era when those things were happening. Does that make me a fly in the ointment? <laughs> That's an interesting one. That's when you introduce guilt into the information stream. That's the serpent going, here you go, have an apple. <laughs> um, that's a really good one. Our culture seems unequivocal about it. If you sit on your hands while evil is happening, you're evil guilt. Um, now what? <laughs> uh, part two, I suppose. 